afternoon, I want to welcome you to the International Republican Institute as we celebrate the 25th anniversary of Mongolian democracy. Today's presentation is entitled, Marking 25 Years of Democracy in Mongolia, Past Accomplishments, Lessons Learned, and Future Plans. This event is one of several that IRI is undertaking in 2015 to mark Mongolia's democratic revolution. In just two weeks, an IRI delegation will be joining our friends and partners in Ulaanbaatar for celebrations marking the anniversary of the country's first democratic elections in 1990. Mongolia's story is an amazing one. Against significant odds, but armed with a desire to live in freedom, the people of Mongolia sought democracy through nonviolent protest and managed to turn their aspirations into reality. As we all know, the path towards democratic maturity has not been without challenges. But I think it's very clear to any observer that today Mongolia has come a considerable way in strengthening and consolidating its democracy. For us at IRI, Mongolia represents one of our longest continuous programs. We began working in the country in March of 1991, and since that time we've worked in three main ways to support Mongolia's democratic infrastructure. First, we work with our Mongolian friends to bolster democratic practices through the development of political parties and the parliament. Second, we, worked in assisting, we assisted in strengthening electoral processes through our work with the General Election Commission. And finally, we have helped to address the challenges of democratic governance through working with local government officials and civil society organizations. More recently, IRI programming in Mongolia has focused on assisting local government responsiveness to citizen priorities, developing mechanisms for meaningful, inclusive, and participatory decision-making at the local level. I should also point out that through the past year, IRI has been working with Ulan Bader's mayor, Batul, with municipal government officials and civil society to implement a number of anti-corruption initiatives. Making our work possible in Mongolia through the years has been the National Endowment for Democracy, through its support and guidance both to IRI and to its many Mongolian grantees. I also want to note IRI's very long partnership with the U.S. Agency for International Development in Mongolia, which supported our work on parliamentary and elections training programs. I say that Mongolia is one of the longest continuous programs at IRI, but I want to be precise. Mongolia is much more than a recipient of, US, of IRI training. It's been a partner in IRI training in a number of other countries, such as Kyrgyzstan and Indonesia, as well as through IRI's global initiative, the Women's Democracy Network. Mongolia is uniquely positioned to be a role model in democratic consolidation, as well as a case study to address governance challenges that arise in democratic transition. To talk a little bit more about this with you today, we're very fortunate to have two highly knowledgeable speakers with us. Carl, in particular, says he has been studying for the <laughs> last two weeks. And he brought a book on Genghis Khan with him this, uh, to this meeting. But uh, the first of our two speakers, His Excellency Lundeg Perev Suren, now serves as the Foreign Minister of Mongolia. He also holds the title of National Security and Foreign Policy Advisor to President Elbig Dorch a position he has held since October 2009. Prior to serving in that capacity, His Excellency served as the first Secretary and Counselor at the Department of Europe in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He also has served in Mongolian embassies in Germany. He's fluent in Mongolian, English, German, and Russian, and he has a distinguished career as a diplomat in his country's foreign service. His Excellency holds degrees from Moscow State Institute of International Relations, the Diplomatic School at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Federal Republic of Germany, Victoria University, the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, and the Harvard Kennedy School. We will hear from His Excellency in just a few moments, but our first speaker is going to be Carl Gershman, President of the National Endowment for Democracy, which is the world's leading organization working to strengthen democratic institutions globally. In addition to presiding over the endowments, thousands of partnerships and programs in Africa, Asia, the Middle East, Eastern Europe, the former Soviet Union, and Latin America. In Carl's very lengthy tenure as head of the endowment, he has overseen the creation of such important platforms as the Journal of Democracy, the International Forum for Democratic Studies, and the Reagan Facel Democracy Fellows Program. 
Mr. Gershman took the lead in launching the World Movement for Democracy in 1999, which is a global network of democracy practitioners and scholars. He's also been very active around the world, and we have seen this work through IRI, in trying to encourage other democracies to establish their own vehicles devoted to the promotion of democratic institutions. And one of the newest of which was established in Mongolia, the International Cooperation Bureau under President Elbig Dulce. With that, let me turn that over to Carl, who's going to speak to us, and then he'll be followed by His Excellency. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, and welcome. It's really uh, great to be here with, uh, with IRI uh, today on this really important occasion. Um, you know, when a country like Mongolia becomes a democracy, it it really challenges our understanding. I mean, I consider it to be something of a miracle. Um, because and Mongolia had none of what we call the prerequisites for democracy when communism fell in 1990. We ran an article in the Journal of Democracy in 1998, in the July 1998 issue, called Mongolia Democracy Without prerequisites. And I want to talk about that tonight to try to understand how this miracle took place. And it really, it's wonderful to have the foreign minister with us. He's a friend um, to basically say if what I'm saying makes any sense, because I don't know. I'm trying to understand what I think is a really challenging and difficult problem. Mongolia was under the USSR for longer than any other country um, under, under communism after the, after the uh, Soviet Revolution in 1917. It had a very low standard of living at the level of Albania when the revolution took place. It was very dependent on Soviet assistance. 95% of its trade was with the USSR. It had no tradition of democracy. It had an awful geographic location between Russia and China. It had a single dominant party from communism the People's Revolutionary Party got over 80% of the seats in the Great Hural in the first election in July of 1990. Mongolia was, you know, as I said, under communism longer than any other country in the Soviet bloc. It had experienced Stalinist terror, forced collectivization, arbitrary mass executions, the destruction of religious organizations. It was a country that was completely isolated. How can we explain? Mongolia's successful democratic transition. When there, you know, we know that democratic transition is difficult, and there have been a lot of failed democratic transitions. In the article we ran in the journal by a Berkeley scholar named Stephen Fish, he he said that the uh, that Fish said that suggested that there were a few possible explanations some of which you know, it was a small country, it was uh, hom homogeneous from an ethnic standpoint, uh, it had a hardy nomadic population which encouraged individualism, but these are not sufficient explanations in my view. The article was written two years after the successful 1996 election, which was won by the liberal opposition Democratic Coalition, which had two parties, the Democratic Party and the Social Democratic Party. Mongolia was ruled to be free by Freedom House in 1998, the only post-communist country outside of Eastern Europe that was so ranked by Freedom House. It should have been like Turkmenistan, not like Poland. Why did it become more like Poland than Turkmenistan? And Fish reviews a number of factors. I'll just review them briefly with you. That there was a, there was a dedication to compromise, tolerance, and nonviolence. The pioneering opposition groups like the Democratic Union and the Social, Dem and the, uh, Social Democratic Movement embraced nonviolence, and, the, and the, accommodations, the accommodationists won between the ruling NPRP party. And this had, in, from the point of view of Fish, a, a number of felicitous outcomes. The constitution of Mongolia emerged out of a genuine process of deliberation and struggle within the national legislature, 71 days packed with uh, marathon legislative sessions. It was the work of an elected body. It was based on compromise and inclusiveness. It had legitimacy. It enhanced the prestige of the parliament, the fact that they were able to do this. 
A second factor he points to is that the norms of tolerance on the part of the ruling party and loyalty of the opposition party were established very early on. And this virtuous cycle of mutual reassurance that ca carried over into future political battles in Mongolia. He talked about real economic reform, which happened very early in Mongolia, sweeping privatization, private livestock ownership nearly tripled in the first three years of Mongolia, Mongolia after communism. The private sector grew from less than 5% to more than 80%. The populist firebrand, he was known at the time, Batul, uh, now the mayor, said that the people were freed from total dependence on the government. Private herds, he said, private shops, free trade. We've, we've got these now, and there's no freedom without that. Mongolia also made auspicious institutional choices. They chose a semi-presidential system on the French model, where the president and the parliament were able to check each other. Neither was able to retain uh, or hold uh, hegemonic power. People rejected the one-man dictatorship of the communist era. And there was also a kind of muscular multi-partyism. The MPRP was the only f political force until 1993, but the opposition then launched a vigorous campaign to expand their parties. IRI's contract with Mongolia was a, you know, a very important part of that. Actually, Fish doesn't mention that, but he, what he should have. And the Democratic coalition won 50 of 70 seats in the 76 seats in the parliament in the 1996 election. And the parties were also clearly differentiated, opposing, having opposing programs and positions so that the, po the, uh, the population could be given clear choices. And since 1992, there have been six direct presidential elections and six direct parliamentary elections, which is quite, uh, which is quite remarkable. And there is also a vibrant civil society. He points to two aspects of that civil society, um, a journalist associations and also women's groups. And we and Ned helped one of these uh, uh, women's organizations, the very quaintly named Liberal Women's Brain Pool, which was a terrific grantee for a number of years. All this is good, but to me, it still doesn't explain why Mongolia could take this path that other countries, you know, where, where communism fell did not. Why, why did it not become, you know, like Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, uh, for example, or other, you know, the other countries in Central Asia or, you know, uh, Russia or Belarus and, and so many other countries? Why was Mongolia different? And, you know, when I try to think and understand that problem, uh, I think, first of all, you know, maybe, the geo maybe there's something positive about the geographic location. Because you know, if you just had one of those two countries near you and not both of them, each one of them would try to dominate you. But maybe they check each other. Maybe that's helpful. I don't know. I'd be interested in the foreign minister's views on that. But I also think there was another factor. And you know, it's something that has to do with Mongolia's history. And last year, my friend Lundig gave me this book, which, I, which um, Tom mentioned which is called Genghis Khan and the Making of the Modern World. When we think about Genghis Khan, what do we think about? We think about you know, a conqueror, somebody who conquered and you know, was violent with other peoples. But it's really a remarkable book. It's by a professor, Jack Weatherford, who's at uh, McAllister College in, uh, in Minnesota. And he tells an amazing story. The fact that in just 25 years, Genghis Khan built the largest land empire in the history of mankind. 11 to 12 million square miles, larger than the continent of Africa, larger than all of North America, including you know, not only the United States and Canada or Mexico, but Central America and the Caribbean. Uh, a massive uh, territory stretching from Hungary to Vietnam and from Korea to the Balkans. The emp this empire joined Europe, which at the time, the early 13th century, was relatively backward with the flourishing cultures of Asia. It consolidated smaller countries into larger ones. The Slavic principalities uh, were brought together, which became later the Russian state. Weaving it wove together the remnants of the Sung dynasty in the south with Western Manchuria, Tibet, East Turkestan, uh, where the Uyghurs are, into what would later become Greater China. It established diplomatic and commercial relationships within this vast territory. It created the world's largest free trade zone and its first international postal system. The only permanent structures they built during this period were bridges, as he points out, uh, to connect this territory. And according to Weatherford, the Mongols were not just conquerors, 
but civilization's unrivaled cultural carriers. That's quite remarkable. And I can, I'm only suggesting, but I think, and nobody's really pointed this out, that to me, there has to be a link between this history and the fact that just over 18, 800 years ago, Mongolia built this kind of an empire, of, of the like of which was never seen in the world today, and a, and a, and a civilizing empire, uh, and the fact that today has been able to build a successful democracy. I think there's also a link between this history and the fact that Mongolia today has a remarkably internationalist outlook. This may have to do with its geographic location between two giants who are not very not friendly neighbors, and so that Mongolia constantly is seeking to strengthen its ties with other countries, which it calls its third neighbor. And this, this combination of internationalism and democracy has led it to chair, not just the community of democracies in 2013, but in 2003, it was the chair of the International Conference of New and Restored Democracies. More recently, it is the chair of the uh, Freedom Online Coalition, the non-intergovernmental organization to promote internet freedom. And it has also launched the network of democratic leaders. But it has a real commitment to this, unlike other countries. Who else in the world today has this kind of commitment? And this internationalist perspective has also led it to commit funds, as Tom suggested, to supporting and sharing its experiences with other countries that need democratic help. That includes Kyrgyzstan, with which it has had parliamentary exchanges and has helped to on legal reform, Afghanistan, where it has conducted trainings for diplomatic and public servants, Burma, with which it has hosted journalists and civil society organizations, and even North Korea, with which it has concluded a, conducted a dialogue on economic policy and security. One of the most stunning actions was President Elbeg George's address, which I think many of you probably are aware of, at the Kim Il-sung University during his visit to North Korea in October of 2013. In, this, in his speech at Kim Il-sung University, he said, and I quote, no tyranny lasts forever. It is the desire of the people to live free that is the eternal, eternal power. He also told his North Korean audience, in North Korea, that 20 years earlier, Mongolia had declared itself a nuclear-free zone and that it prefers ensuring her security by political, diplomatic, and economic means, not by nuclear weapons. This raises yet another possible factor accounting for Mongolia's success, and that is its leadership. I don't think I have ever read a more passionate defense of freedom and democracy than the address that President Elbegdorj delivered just last October to the Central European University in Budapest, which is a Soros-funded uh, institution. Speaking about the power of freedom, he said that there are countries in the world today where people live in captivity and fear. And he said he believed that, one, and this is a quote, one day from prison camps and torture cells and, and from exile, the leaders of freedom will emerge. The world should stand with those oppressed until the day their freedom finally arrives. You know, and there are leaders in our country today and in Europe that would do well to heed these words, but they don't. And he has this, it's amazing to me that this leader of a small, relatively remote Asian country has a stronger commitment to these values, which we call Western values, than at least as is being expressed today by the leaders of the Western democracies. Something that Henry Kissinger once wrote about Bruno Kreisky, the late chancellor of Austria, applies to President Elbegdorj. And Chris Kissinger wrote, one of the asymmetries of history is the lack of correspondence between the abilities of some leaders and the power of their countries. President Elbegdorj is such an outsized leader of a small country. And that, too, has something to do with Mongolia's success as a new democracy, at least in my view. This doesn't mean that Mongolia's democracy is secure. It faces major challenges, as, president, as the president recognized in his Budapest speech when he worried about the possible decay of democracy, something that our friend, uh, his friend, and our NED board member, Frank Fukuyama, um, has uh, written a great deal about. And he said that today Mongolia is wrestling to reinstate the original principles of our constitution. The biggest problem, he said, is corruption. 
which is a brutal force capable of destroying institutions, values, culture, and the nation. Our friend who was mentioned before, uh, Erdin Batul, who is now the city governor of Ulaanbaatar, has gone so far as to say that democracy in Mongolia is in a disgraceful condition. And he warned that unless it is fixed, it would face a fatal condition. And this is a quote from Batul. Uh, a fatal condition like a hospital patient waiting helplessly for his, for his uh, death on, in bed. Now, that's very strong rhetoric. But it's also a call to action by a committed Democrat. And I think it's important that you have committed Democrats like Batul and President el in, in elected positions of power um, in Mongolia. And I'm also impressed that President el even sometimes sounds like his friend Larry Diamond uh, when he, when, like a political scientist, in that, uh, in that speech in uh, Budapest, he called for building institutions of vertical, vertical and horizontal accountability. This is a president talking, not Larry Diamond. Vertical, I've heard Larry say that a hundred times. Vertical and horizontal accountability to deal with corruption and other problems of, de uh, uh, of democracy and democratic governance. And in addition to fighting corruption, Mongolia also has to strengthen the rule of law so that politicians don't ignore the rules or change them to suit their own narrow interests, as the political scientist Mende, who is at British Columbia University, says. He's a friend of ours. And he also, this same political scientist, warned about the politicization of, secu of security and law enforcement organizations and the inf influence of business interests on politicians. The threat to democracy, therefore, of problems like corruption and crony politics only underlines something that Ben Franklin said right after the Constitutional Convention that approved our US Constitution in 1987. As I think a lot of you know this story, the convention had been held in secrecy, uh, and citizens had gathered outside Independence Hall in Philadelphia anxiously hoping to find out what had been agreed to. And as Franklin left the hall, a woman named Mrs. Powell stopped him and asked, well, doctor, what have we got, a republic or a monarchy? To which he replied without any hesitation, a republic, if you can keep it. And that's the challenge for Mongolia today and for every other democracy in this time of democratic malaise, including our own. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for introducing me and inviting me to speak here. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Carl, as a good friend of mine. So for good words uh, about Mongolian history as Mongolia. It's, it's, it's happy to hear that you, you, uh, you wrote the book I gave you, I think, <laughs> two years ago. Yeah. And of course, there um, uh, was talk now about uh, 25 years anniversary of Mongolian democracy. We're going to celebrate our market in two weeks, July 29th. We have the main celebration in the Lambatar inviting us of foreign dignitaries uh, when 25 years ago took place the first free election in Mongolia. As Karl saying, the Mongolia was the second communist uh, country after the Soviet Union, 1921. There, uh, there was uh, folks, people's revolution, and only in 1990 we uh, change their uh, that's the regime. But why is Mongolia uh, relatively successful on the way to democracy? I think uh, the card is right. There are something also to do with the Mongolian history. 800 years ago, Mongols managed to build the world's biggest empire, Mongolian empire, under the Chinggis Khan and Kublai Khan, Ogode Khan. But uh, the empire has been ruled under the written law. The constitution that did during the Chinggis Khan time called the great governance. I think the tradition somehow influenced also the modern Mongolian history. 
and uh, therefore is we have the great and uh, very rich history and then tradition of the statehood, and that's also somehow helped uh, Mongolia to establish quickly also democratic uh, governance system. I wouldn't uh, come back to the 25 years anniversary back, uh, to, to history back, but I would like to uh, tell some words about the future of the Mongolian uh, development. It's really 25 years is uh, uh, the generation, and we are now the time to um, uh, look back and also analyze what we reached, uh, reached and then also what was the, the falls and the failures and what, was the, what we are learned. On the way to democracy, the Mongolian way was not only the success, there was also failures. And uh, we are learning from, uh, from the, our failures. And now many Mongolian politicians are talking about it's the time to maybe amend or change the constitution. Personally, I think it's also time because we are somehow now finishing uh, the transition period and then the country need to adopt the, another uh, mechanism to make the decisions very quickly. After the uh, communism where Mongolia suffered under the one man rule, which was for 40 years, the last uh, communist ruler suffered under the one, uh, one man rule. Therefore, is the constitution was chosen, originally was uh, decided to copy the German-like constitution, but in the last moment, we are choosing the semi-presidential system. There is today is some, some problem for us. The decision-making process takes too long. In the modern world now, sometimes, especially the government, need to, uh, to work quickly also uh, to make decisions uh, uh, should be also easy. But there are complicated uh, ways, and therefore, as many now an analysts saying we are, uh, should uh, now reform uh, the constitution, maybe this is not the uh, main problem whether we sh should choose the pure uh, parliamentary type of democracy or presidential one. That's not the main reason. I think it's about the uh, uh, prime minister and also the parliament uh, relation. We gave, I think, too much power to the parliamentary uh, MPs. Their, their fraction and, uh, in the parliament is not really working. There are more individuals we have in the parliament, and therefore we, are certain, we should change certain rules in the parliamentary debate, and that uh, should strengthen in the parties and also party, um, party fractions in the, in, the, in the parliament. That's the main issue, what we are talking, and uh, so it, to reform the, the constitution now. I don't think that the constitution is going to be changed before the next election. Next general election will be held in June uh, 2016, exactly in one year. So maybe we're going to start this year slowly the, the, the discussion on the constitutional reform, but real reform or voting maybe uh, will be after the election the next year. So Mongolia, as a Carl saying, we would like to be as a role model in the, in the region for the demo, uh, demo, democratic transition. And uh, uh, we would like to share our experiences with other nations. As a pres President El Victor saying, we have nothing to teach to others, but we have something to share with other emerging uh, democracies. And uh, uh, within the Minister of Foreign Affairs, we have uh, created two years ago the Mongolian International Cooperation Fund. So we allocated some budget for that and uh, with the goal to share our experience with other nations. And we're inviting now uh, Myanmar delegates, also uh, Kyrgyzstan delegates, also journalists, Afghan people and others. And uh, we are clearly saying uh, to the uh, Myanmar people, 
that we are working not only with the, with the government, we are, would like to work also parallel with the opposition. We just hosted the Myanmar president for the state visit two weeks ago in Mongolia. And I was the, uh, three years ago, first person after 40 years uh, visiting Myanmar and um, uh, restoring the historic to talks and then ties with uh, Myanmar. And then that time I met us Aung San Suu Kyi, and then later we hosted her for one week in Mongolia. Now we are working very closely with the NLD uh, and uh, training the NLD people, also campaign people. Uh, also, we are sending our experts and sharing our experiences uh, for campaign, also for the election. Just uh, one week ago, the, the lady also called the president, and we are now sending also our experts to uh, train the uh, Myanmar uh, NLD experts for the upcoming election. You know, the uh, Myanmar election should be not only free, it should be also fair. That's the problem. Uh, the uh, uh, voters' uh, registration. <coughs> there could be some fault and some cheating for, for, for the regime side, for the ruling uh, party side. And then therefore, is we are uh, now sharing our experiences. And then because uh, uh, we went also through that way, the old Communist Party also cheated many times the, the constitution, uh, the, the election results. And we discovered it's very late. And <clears throat> five years ago, we started also to introduce the uh, automatic uh, accounting machineries for, uh, for Mongolian election uh, countrywide. That was uh, a very fair one and it's a very good one. And then as a result, uh, Democratic Party also uh, won also the, the, the elections. And then therefore, it's important for us to help the emerging democracies sharing our own experiences. The same situation for the Kyrgyz stands. Kyrgyz uh, had also election this year. And the last three years after the uh, Kyrgyz uh, uh, last election, we are working very closely with the Kyrgyz people. Rosa Otombayeva, interim president, uh, in the first day of her interim president, uh, presidentship, she wrote uh, uh, later to the president, uh, personal letter to the president, El Dorshan, saying, so Mongolia is for us a role model. We would like to, to, uh, to follow the Mongolian way and then please help us. And then we started immediately also program in Kyrgyzstan. We are training now the Kyrgyz uh, officials in the Mongolia also very uh, wide exchange of the parliamentarians. So we trained also Kyrgyz uh, pro-democracy journalists in Mongolia. And uh, also uh, we helping the Kyrgyzstan uh, uh, to draft the new law on the public uh, service reform, mining law, election law, uh, also decentralization uh, programs, all others. Also same also Myanmar, because after the uh, military regime, there are certain lack of the initiatives uh, among the public officers. Therefore, we have started now the training program for the high and the middle level uh, public officers from, from uh, Myanmar. And we already this year hosted all the president advisors in Mongolia and also the, uh, the state secretary level offic officials from uh, Myanmar ministries in Mongolia also journalists in Mongolia. And uh, that's also uh, certain results we have already. And then we have started also open dialogue using that uh, Mongolian um, uh, fund. So same program we have started in Afghanistan, inviting also young diplomats from Afghanistan. So just five days ago, we um, uh, attended the BRICS summit, also the Shanghai Cooperation Summit in Ufa. We met again the uh, the President Ghani, and then Ghani is personally also expressing interest, also asking the president to help Afghanistan to to establish the new government, uh, and, and I think we will do that. 
So Mongolia is also working closely with North Korea. As Carl mentioned, the president had a lecture to the uh, Kim il -sung University. Also, we started uh, very open dialogue with the, with the North Korean um, officials, inviting uh, North Korean officials for their training in Mongolia and the workshops in Mongolia. They are interested to learn from Mongolian uh, economic reform. Of course, they are uh, uh, no words about the political re reform in North Korea, but first of all, they're interested to learn from our economic reform. How was the privatization, and then how was the, the first years of, the, uh, of their economic transition? That's, I think, is for, for the North Korea, it's very, very important to learn what, what was the failures and what was the success in the Mongolian uh, way to the democracy. And globally, we are also successfully chaired the community of democracies in 2013-14. And we have uh, contributed to uh, strengthen the structure of the organization. Now, in a few days from the, after the U.S. visit, I'm going to join as a ministerial meeting of the community of democracies in, in El Salvador. And uh, we have chaired now the Freedom Online Coalition and hosted I'm personally in May this year, the ministerial meeting in Ulaanbaatar. And of course, to, in comparison with the two other neighbors where the online freedom more and more limited, uh, Mongolia is uh, keen to, to keep the, the freedom uh, uh, online uh, alive. We think that uh, every four years, five, year, five years, the voter is going, the citizen is going to vote and choose the government is not enough. Democratic governments should allow their citizens every day um, uh, the, uh, the access to, the, to speak out and crit uh, to criticize the government, also to, to tell the opinions about the governance. Uh, that's also very important for the future of the country. You know the ge ge geopolitical situation in Mongolia is sandwiched between Russia, Mong uh, Russia and China. 25 years ago, that was the same situation. The situation has changed. But I would say, as career diplomat, it's worsening the situation for Mongolia too. Because the uh, sanction, because the uh, problems in the Russian economy, Russia is, Russia, China is very, very close now. So, uh, and then in, in the, from the history we know, when the Russia and China close, that's bad for Mongolia. And therefore, it's now a very uh, uh, crucial time for us to be, to be wise and then to, be, to keep our the third neighbor policy uh, alive. And then therefore, is, um, I had today, uh, just two hours ago, the, a meeting, a conversation with the, uh, uh, Secretary uh, John Kerry. He came just uh, back from 19 days, I think, 18 days, conversation with the Iran. And I was first. Uh, I think foreign guests meeting him after the Iran deal, and we briefed each other about the offer and then also, uh, also Iran deal. And the uh, US is a uh, leading uh, country for in, the, uh, in the world, in the economically also in the, in the way to the, the democracy and then others for the free world, and also the leading partner for us in the third neighbor policy. And we would like also uh, keep uh, also broader not only political um, uh, cooperation and relation, um, also the economic cooperation. And of course, the China and Russia is uh, surrounding Mongolia. The interest is very clear. They would like keep, keep Mongolia only for them, not for the other countries. Therefore, is Mongolian uh, diplomats was genuine enough early 90s to create the concept of the third neighbor policy. And then I'm foreign minister. As foreign minister, I'm going to also uh, keep on that principle. And uh, I just, uh, one week ago, I organized the ambassador's conference in Ulaanbaatar. And uh, we have also some new ideas. Maybe if Mongolian constitution is going to change it or am amend it, we should also put one new foreign policy principle. That's uh, Mongolia is globally is going to 
uh, fight for their human right, for their for the democracy and transparency and the rule of law. It should be anchored in the in the Mongolian constitution as principle one of the basic principles of the Mongolian Mongolian foreign policy. We know that uh, U.S. also many Scandinavian countries. Uh, I heard that recently Finland is also uh, putting their that principle as new principle for their foreign policy. It should be also uh, for, uh, one of the basic principles for the Mongolian uh, foreign policy, and then uh, enabling also to share our experiences on the way to democracy and human rights, and then others with other nations, especially with the emerging nations. As President El Bagdorj is saying, we would like to be the anchor, democratic anchor on the East. And uh, of course, it's challenging, but we are, uh, we are ready and we are willing to, to uh, 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 the democracy alive in Mongolia and then also in the foreign policy uh, concepts. That's the shortly what I could tell you today. And then thank you and ready for, for the answer to your, your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We do have time for a few questions or comments, if anyone. I know this is a crowd that is very familiar with the democratic revolution. Would someone like to speak? Yes, ma'am. We have a microphone for you. I'm Susan Lawrence with the Congressional Research Service, um, the think tank for the US Congress. Uh, I was struck by your comment about when Russia and China get along, it's not necessarily good for Mongolia. I wondered if you could explain a bit more uh, how Russia and China's relationship affects Mongolia. And I had a specific question about China's One Belt, One Road initiative. I understand that Mongolia is part of that, and I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more. Thank you. So I'm going to start from the second question. You know that China announced the one belt, uh, new Silk Road, uh, the belt or one one road or one belt. Uh, there was concern for us first. Maybe uh, the Silk Road is going to west from the China, avoiding Mongolia, and we will stay away from that uh, that program. But uh, during the Bao Economic Forum we see uh, in March, I think, that China first time published the paper, concept paper for that. And uh, there uh, was uh, uh, some phrases that's economic corridor, China, Mongolia, Russia. So it's a North Corridor is going to through Mongolia. I think definitely Russians also walk it, uh, toward the China, China that because uh, you know the Russian Siberia uh, is, uh, is living from the Trans-Siberian Railway. If the Trans-Siberian Railway not working or not used, then Russia, Siberia is very in a difficult situation. So five million people, they are among the, most of them are among the Trans-Siberian Railway. And, uh, then we started, uh, as you know, the last year, the uh, Mongolian president, uh, Elbek Dorj, initiated the first time Mongolian, Russian, Chinese trilateral summit. We would like to have it in white in Ulaanbaatar. Therefore, we are calling it Ulaanbaatar summit of, of three. But the first summit took place during the Shanghai Cooperation Organization summit last year in Doshanbe, September. And uh, the second one is just now in, uh, in Ofa, one week ago. We uh, uh, organized the second summit. So meantime, we have established a trilateral uh, uh, mechanism of the uh, consultation in the level of the vice minister for foreign affairs. So the result is we just signed uh, four documents in, in Ofa. Uh, one of them is uh, the creating the economic corridor uh, uh, Russia, uh, Mongolian, and Chinese economic corridor. We're going to work on this program maybe within the next months, and then goal is maybe within one year we're going to have the concept ready. And Mongolia is mainly interested uh, um, on the economic or infrastructure projects because the growing Chinese and Russian trade uh, the Mongolia is uh, sandwiched between them also. There are some uh, short ways to go through the Mongolia railway. We have the existing railway in the one line. There should be the, the second line. 
also the some other corridors, railway corridors, western corridor or eastern corridor through the Mongolian territory. Also, there are some talks about the possible uh, gates pipeline through the Mongolian territory. You know the power of Siberia is went uh, avoiding Mongolia, uh, uh, east from Mongolia, from uh, through the Manjur. But uh, the Altai pipeline went or decided two sides, uh, uh, also avoiding Mongolian territory between the Mongolia and Kyrgyzstan. But the project, I think, not finally decided because the technical difficulties and the others. Maybe then it's possible also a third line through the Mongolian territory. And we should also build an own uh, capacity. We don't have the experiences on that issue, and we are preparing on that. And all the projects is, of course, the, uh, the uh, grid for, for the electricity. Uh, Russia has a certain surplus uh, in the uh, Baikal Sea area from the hydro power stations. The China needs some electricity uh, and that could uh, go through the Mongolia. Also, the highway through the Mongolian territory. That's the project we are Mongolia most interested. And of course, uh, there are political issues, humanitarian issues. We are talking about it, uh, that. The first question: Why the why the Russia and uh, if the, the Russia and China is closed and they're bad for Mongolia? That's uh, happened several times in the Mongolian history. And actually, uh, as the Karl mentioned, we are, we were also uh, we were creating also the United Russia, bringing the power from Kiev to the Moscow in the, in the 14th, uh, 14th century. So again, we also uh, created the United China. <laughs> and then everywhere where the Mongols was also, of course, we had left some uh, culture of the statehood and uh, so prospering the culture and art and others. The same was for Janus the, during the Yuan dynasty and also the same was for the Russia. But uh, later, uh, Mongolia uh, became uh, part of the Manju dynasty, where the Manjus uh, was uh, uh, ruling in China, both Mongolia and China under the Manju rule. Well, then uh, starting in 1921, Mongolia became the second communist country and then the very close satellite state from Soviet Union. And we have, the, we have also certain time between 1945, uh, when uh, Red Army together to Mongolian Army liberated China from the uh, Japan occupation until 1964. Four or five, when the Russian and Chinese relations uh, uh, get colder, that's 20 years we had also similar situation when Russia and China was close and friends and also enjoyed peaceful time. But there was a certain uh, pressure on the Mongolia together. But when uh, started the Cold War time between the Russia and China, then we experienced it that uh, Mongolia forced it to be on the side of the Soviet Union, and then south border was closed till 1990. And we had then, uh, since 1990, we had uh, now balanced cooperation between China and Russia. We uh, would like to balance between China and Russia, we have the national security concept where saying, so uh, we would like to balance in the relation between Russia and China. So exactly 100 years ago, 1915, there was also HIACT agreement. In 1911, Mongolia declared independence from the Manju Empire. And uh, then be invited to talk the three literal uh, negotiations in the Kiakt in the Mongolian city, the border city of Mongolian Russian border city. And then after four years negotiations, Mongolian independence was also uh, finished. Mongolia recognized uh, from Russia, uh, from Soviet Union as part of the, the China. 
So that's the last one exactly happened 100 years ago. Therefore, there's also some fear in the Mongolian population that's what's the dealing with, uh, between the Russia and China. Of course, the Russia and China is interested to keep Mongolia uh, between them, isolated. Also, democratic, wealthy, stable Mongolia will be a big headache for Russia and China. Because we have the Mongolian diaspora in the border region in, uh, in Mongolia, in Xinjiang, Uyghur, we have also a Mongolian uh, population. We have uh, in the Russian territory, we have the Buryats, also Tuwa, and then part of the Altai uh, province is Mongols. And they, saw, uh, they see now today how is the Mongolia is growing, how is the democratic society is growing, also enabling also for the development. That will be also going to affect maybe some Russian regions, also uh, Chinese in Mongolia. And then therefore, the fear to have very prosperous, stable, also democratic Mongolia. Therefore, it's also China and Russia is uh, uh, in common one issue to keep Mongolia for them, as maybe uh, in other ways. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mindy Reiser. I'm vice president of an NGO called Global Peace Services. I wanted to ask you about the role that Mongolia could play in the whole area of sustainable development and attention to eco ecological and environmental issues. You've been a model and an exemplar to a number of countries, and I understand that there are problems both of pollution and environmental damage, some of it coming from the mining, the, the, the extraction. I wonder what your thoughts are as to how Mongolia can work on these issues and what it can teach other countries that rely on, on mineral extraction for a lot of their gross national product. So you're right, uh, we have uh, uh, also certain problems. Air pollution, in, especially in the capital city, Ulaanbaatar, city designed about for 500,000 people, 500, people, but now reached the population about 1.3 million. Uh, it's crowded, really. In the winter time, we have, we have the air pollution problem. It's not only winter, also even the summer time. But globally, uh, Mongolia, generally Mongolia is very worsely affected by the global warming. So average warming uh, in the worldwide is, uh, I think, 0.3 or something like that. But Mongolia is uh, last uh, 15 or 30 years, the warming is about 2 degrees. So 70% of the territory is affected by the desertification. So we are contributing to the desertification also ourselves. You know that during communism time, we had only 20 million, 25 million uh, livestock. But now it reached 70 million. So it's overgrazing. And therefore, is we are also working with the herders how to, how to manage it. And the other issue is, of course, uh, mining activities. We have the growing mining activities. Uh, they uh, um, get the name in the, the Mongolia or something like that. But we have the, some bad experiences, also damaging the, damaging the environment. Therefore, as President Elbeg George, for four years ago, he stopped the, to issue the new licenses. So that was a huge protest from the mining industry uh, or the others. But we managed it uh, now to uh, reduce the uh, the territory which affected by the mining leases is from the about 50% uh, now about 10%. That's a very good result. The good thing is the people now uh, get the knowledge or knowledgeable about the environment. We have certain tradition, nomadic tradition, to uh, uh, to keep the the. the uh, uh, the environment free, also not polluted. But uh, starting with the city kids and the others, they were, they, the tradition was lost. And we are, uh, started to teach in the, in, the, uh, in the classes, starting the first class, the civic education programs were included also the, uh, the ecological 
classes, starting the first class and the kindergarten and others. And that's also bringing also knowledgeable for the, for the, for the citizen. Also, we're using a social media very successfully, Facebook and, uh, and the Twitter and others. They used also to campaign against the, the uh, pollution, against the uh, eco, eco pollution and others. And we are, Mongolia is uh, one of the earliest members of the EITI. Uh, and uh, also Myanmar and then North Korea, Kyrgyzstan is interested to learn from Mongolian uh, program accompanying the mining industry. Because the, you know, the Myanmar also, the Kyrgyzstan is also mining nations. Also Chinese companies there, Western companies there. Also there are some uh, environmental uh, movements is there and then uh, they have direct contacts with Mongolia and of course, uh, President Elbuk Dorch is showing his uh, political leadership. He was uh, awarded by the UNEP, I think, four, three years ago for his policy uh, leadership for the environment as uh, a champion of the earth. And uh, he also had a very famous speech on the uh, COP in Copenhagen several years ago. Definitely we're going to also now contribute to, to clinch the deal during the upcoming COP summit in, in Paris later this year. Who is chairman of the House Democracy Partnership, of which Mongolia is a member, might want to say a few words. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Put you on the spot. Peter? Well, I'm really pleased to be here, and I had the opportunity to visit with the minister this afternoon when he experienced our own little democratic process that was uh, trying to find members in the middle of votes on Capitol Hill, and he was very gracious, and we had a great opportunity to have a, a, a very good exchange. I'm here uh, as a part of the House Democracy Partnership, which, as many of you know, is a an interaction between uh, members of the House and uh, our democratic friends in emerging emerging democracies around the world. And we've had a very strong relationship with Mongolia. So um, I, I found myself listening not just to our, our discussion minister when we met in the Rayburn Room a couple of hours ago, but also listening and learning from Carl's, um, Carl's historical perspective and also the minister's uh, recitation of why this is a great great nation to celebrate. And um, I think there's a lot to emulate here. We know that there's rising voice, voices of authoritarianism all over the world, and these voices want to crush rising democracies. And I think the fact that the minister is here and we've got 25 years to celebrate is something to, to promote and something to celebrate and something to, um, something to defend and be grateful for. So, Minister, you're a great example, I think, for all folks around the world, and particularly those of us in this room that are gathered around these larger themes of freedom and pushing back against authoritarianism and looking for voices and examples. And as, as you and I discussed um, in closing, uh, the nature of your proximity and your two large neighbors, that is Russia and China, that have a very low view of those democratic principles, makes you all the more cel uh, all the more special. So we're here to honor you, and we're here to celebrate you, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Carl. Brian, Carl, Tom, old friends, uh, distinguished colleagues. I'm honored to be representing USAID and the State Department and the Obama administration in conveying my congratulations to the Mongolian government and the Mongolian people for the phenomenal success of their democratic transition for the last quarter century. Uh, Carl and Tom have chronicled, and uh, the minister himself have chronicled this success, so I won't repeat it now in, in my remarks. But I just wanted to say it's, uh, as a diplomat and an aid professional, it's been great that it's uh, 
domestic transition, both political and economic, and that success has been a beacon. But even more importantly for us, it's um, foreign policy success, it's democracy promotion, human rights protection foreign policy has been a true beacon throughout Asia and for the rest of the world. We've talked about the uh, leadership of the International Conference of Newer Restored Democracies. We talked about the Mong very successful Mongolian chair of the community of democracies. We didn't talk about uh, its leadership uh, during the period of now eclipsing of the Millennium Development Goals. Mongolia pioneered the uh, ninth Millennium Development Goal on democratic governance and was a leader throughout the world on that. And it's truly been uh, an important leader in the developing world on pioneering what's uh, being termed goal 16 of the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which will be endorsed by world leaders this September uh, on um, peace and inclusive societies. So thanks to Mongolia for all of that. Just to share some personal uh, reminiscences, I've only been to Mongolia once. I went as a USAID official uh, just around 1995, so at that time about the fifth anniversary, I met members of the liberal women's brain pool. I met uh, uh, the very committed, impassioned, and talented uh, young members of IRI who were running then, uh, helping uh, with the uh, contract for Mongolia campaign. I was there in their office. They were showing me their flip charts. And it was a, a, a fantastic experience to be there. So I want to salute the partnership of USAID with IRI and the NED also in supporting having the privilege to support Mongolian democracy for these last 25 years. You know, I'm a simple-minded person. Carl's a complex thinker. I'm a reductionist, and that's my intellectual flaw. So when I was in Mongolia for just those two weeks, you know, of course, I had read about the history, the imperial history, the rule of law history, the uh, dark period under communism. But for me, just to have been there for two weeks to meet the wonderful, warm, earthy, irreverent, funny Mongolian uh, interlocutors that I had during that two-week period, my reductionist brain computed out this conclusion that Mongolians culturally and in their DNA and cultural makeup, as a whether it's a nomadic people or pastoralist people, there was some weird, very special, unique combination of individualism and cooperative, social cooperation that I knew in my bones, having been there just two weeks, it sounds naive, knew it would make them a very special member of the, a uh, new member of the democratic community. And, I'm, and I feel that that intuition has held true. Indeed, Mongolian culture and people, I think, reminded me during those two weeks back in 1995 of my own American experience as an American refugee and immigrant, and our own weird American combination of fierce individualism and social talent for social cooperation. So I think one day, a French social sociologist, or perhaps Frank Fukuyama, will write the follow-up to Democracy in America and call it Mongolia, Mo uh, Democracy in Mongolia. And she or he will bring together the two very unique strains of American and Mongolian exceptionalism. And that will propel the US and Mongolia into another quarter century of leadership for our precious democratic values. Thank you. Uh, Your Excellency, Carl Gershman, uh, Tom Garrett, uh, the North America Mongolia Business Council shares uh, the birthday of Mongolian democracy. Uh, the 